Um, hi everyone, welcome to episode 19 of HR Leaders Live, the show where we discuss the future of work with today's most innovative and successful people leaders. My name is Chris Rainey, co-founder of HRD Leaders and host of the HR Leaders podcast. As always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jill Katz and Matt Burns, partners in crime. <laughs> today's special guest is uh, Lorna Rubis. Uh, Lorna is a chief evangelist at ATB Financial and host of the Culture Cast podcast. Uh, Lauren, welcome to the show. How are you? Very good, Chris. Great to be here with uh, uh, Jill and, um, and Matt and you. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Fantastic. Well, before we jump in, um, for our listeners that haven't come across yourself before, let us know a little bit about yourself personally and, and your journey to, to where we are today. So um, I um, started um, actually as a uh, as a, a school teacher and um, I had a opportunity to kind of be part of me re and helping to reinvent a school that I had, uh, uh, that I was part of when I started my career went and did my graduate work came back to Canada um, we, uh, started a family had a business here for 10 years and and um, went to the US on a one-year sabbatical that ended up being 25 years and during that journey I ended up working directly for the chairman of a fortune 50 company um, I was one of seven people reported to him responsible for worldwide quality and um, uh, led all of his governance. Uh, I worked as um, uh, as the chief operating officer for um, uh, NASDAQ traded technology company. Worked um, uh, for the LA Kings hockey club for a while, which is a fun gig. Um, and um, st uh, started Skype before Skype with a bunch of guys on a sure bet deal that was going to be a 10 bagger and it uh, blew up. Um, and, um, we, had, we were too early and got washed up in the dot-com crash, um, became the CEO of another company was bought out, um, eight years after I was running it. And I spent part of my time in the UK and, uh, doing that, that we are, um, uh, our, uh, European office was at Chippenham, uh, Chris. So I spent a lot of time yeah. in back and then, um, um, had a chance to, um, join um, uh, ATB Financial here in Canada, um, actually going full circle back to my, uh, my roots in Alberta uh, for a 5,000 person, 80 year old uh, financial services company for a CEO who wanted to reinvent banking. And um, he was looking for a non-traditional um, uh, HR leader. So he had the role of a chief people officer and he wanted someone who was passionate about leadership and culture and had a business perspective. And um, and so I joined ATB and for five uh, years, I was the chief people officer in the last year and a half. I was been, had this role entitled chief evangelist. So there's a long winded journey. Um, so I've had winners and losers, but what I've had <laughs> consistently is, um, I've been deeply committed to transformation right from the very first part of my career, um, through, um, right through, um, uh, and I've been in almost every possible situation and type of company to kind of shape my my views and opinions around what drives hr what drives leadership what drives culture so so well, f thank you very much for sharing that it's fascinating where did that transition happen because obviously you were ceo of multiple organizations and then all of a sudden you're a chief people officer how, 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 well, did, that, how did that happen what, what did well that when, when uh the ceo of the company when, when my co when the company i was the ceo of got bought out and uh, i was looking to do to think what i was going to do next I had uh, been introduced through some, uh, just through some network colleagues to, uh, to, to the CEO of, of ATB Financial, his name was Dave Mowat. And um, I said, look, you know, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm not a, uh, I'm, a, I'm a general manager, I, I run companies, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a traditional HR person. And uh, although I've got this deep passion about uh, leadership and culture. and. Um, I was exactly the right match for what Dave was looking for, what he was, what he wanted to do with, uh, to rethink through what driving the whole people strategy and the culture was at ATB. And so it was a perfect match for me really when I thought about it. It was, I, it would gave me an opportunity to focus exactly on what I was deeply passionate about. And that is both uh, the whole people side of the business leadership and culture. And it's been an unbelievable ride here at ATB financial. Um, and uh, you know, when I got here, uh, um, the company was going through a very difficult time. It just gone through a major SAP, the largest SAP implementation of any financial institution in the world. It spent almost $400 million. I mean, people were pissed off. They were tired. Uh, customers, 
<laughs> customers were uh, were uh, were struggling. Uh, it was a remarkable initiative. It just had a lot of difficulty attached to it. So I came in at a time when people were uh, the engagement score had dropped to sixty nine. We had been using an A on you at uh, comprehensive survey for years. It dropped to 69, and I'm leaving six and a half years later as I move into the next part of my journey with our engagement score at 91. Our um, our JD Power scores in the retail side were uh, the lowest in the industry. They're now uh, one of the top uh, three, depending on how you look on highest. Um, our, and we've had the highest financial performance in the history of the company. So uh, it's been a slow, and you know, we're uh, two years ago, uh, we were ranked number two in Canada as a place to work by the great, great place to work organization. So I, I don't mean to share that in the, con in the, in the, from the context of uh, bragging by any means. We've got, we're, we're highly imperfect like any organization. However, I do know it was that we've had a massive transformation in our culture and it's been up. And it's considered to be a real strategic advantage for us here in the financial world. Uh, services industry. So I have a, a question right off the bat, if you don't mind my diving in, which I tend to do. Um, <laughs> I see you, Matt. It's a video. It's a video Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> go, Joe. I'm looking for that New Yorker kind of uh, kicking a behind question, so go oh, after it. Oh, you're going to get it. Don't you worry. Right. You joined the right podcast team. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we, we all work with, with very with varied client groups throughout our careers and in the different roles that we've been in. And we hear a lot of HR leaders talk about the change or growth in engagement scores. The, the numbers that you just quoted, I think you said 69 to 91. That right. is, that's pretty impressive. And for the folks who are listening to today's webcast, I'm sure they're thinking, damn, how exactly did you do that, particularly with such a large employee population and in such a highly regulated business? Can you give us maybe two examples that are really tactical of things that you did that you think helped improve the engagement scores? Yeah, well, one of the things, Joe, when I um, got there and I mentioned that we had just gone through this very uh, difficult kind of implementation, so I knew something was wrong in Mudville because you know what it's like when you first join an organization, you get a chance to just walk around and listen. And, and as I toured around the province, um, I came back and uh, told Dave uh, Moat, our CEO, that we need to call an emergency meeting really of our executive team. And I just said, look, our scores just dropped in 69. People are here. Here's the essence of the data around the frustration. So we stopped all development on everything. We had declared mission accomplished. We took four executives out and spent the next year fixing 220 or 30 major uh, issues. And the reason it was so important, Joe, is because, and when I'm going to share my eight ingredients that I believe, because I have the history now that I can look back a little bit and I can, you know, it's easy to describe these eight ingredients backwards than it is when you're, then, because uh, I, I don't want to imply that I was smart enough to figure them all out of the front end. Uh, however, the, the statement was, is we made people first on that issue. We st um, and that was a hugely important statement. It wasn't just that we said, yeah, because there was a propensity to say, you know, that old George Bush mission accomplished sign after on the Iraq war. And, you know, we had kind of declared mission accomplished and we were not, mission was not accomplished. That was an important thing that we did. And um, one of the things early in my, in my time here is, uh, I created a conversation uh, based on the work of two women that on a book called work sucks because I think there was so much bullshit around, um, around organizations looking at, uh, at, at people being managed by where they work instead of what they do and the results they get. So we introduced something called workplace 2.0, which was a fairly controversial thing at that time. Think about five years ago, by and large, we declared to people that work was where you, uh, where you got the best results. And for many of at least uh, three quarters of our people that are tied, not tied in branches and tied in call centers and things, that meant people could work where they wanted to. And then we had the technology, of course, to do that. That was an incredible statement to our company. So, and frankly, it really freed up people to, uh, to do their best work in the best way without being tied to a nine to five kind of a 
historical kind of a regular way, regulated way of thinking. That doesn't sound so breakthrough maybe right now, but it was for us at that time and is one of the real definitions of, of, of who we are around people. You know, no, there's no sludge here. People literally work where they need to, and it's changed. I mean, we almost, you know, need half the real estate we have because uh, we do still want people to collide and show up in places in our campus and in our main buildings and throughout the province. But by and large, people work where they need to work, whether it's at home, Starbucks, or you name it. Those are a couple of strategic slash tactical things we did that made major statements around uh, our organization. But I've got a ton of them, and I'd like to build on them if you'd like, because those are just the beginning. And because we built an entire system. And as you know, Joe, you don't build a system around cultural advancement. You're going to get a lot of events and a lot of a, a lot of uh, tactical disconnected activity that may not lead to driving. No doubt. So we, I think we would love to hear your, your eight ingredients. Um, and then I'm going to be asking Matt for some thoughts on them, which is always my favorite. I knew that was coming, Jill. Yeah. <laughs> Matt knew I it too. I have not seen these eight ingredients. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm going to skip through. I'm going to I'm going to go through these at lightning speed, uh, out of respect for your audience, and then they, you guys can come and dig in a little bit. But one of the uh, and I'm going to be fairly strategic and high level, and then, and I'll give you all the tactical kind of considerations uh, when you guys dig in. But one of the things that we declared right from our chairperson, um, who's been with uh, uh, on our board for 18 years and uh, ran a large uh, uh, nationwide. Uh, tire dealership actually uh, in Canada. So he's a crusty old retail kind of guy. And right from our CEO and our executive right through, we have um, a people first uh, position. So we have declared that the order of our attention, the lens we always look through is people first, customer second, and shareholders third. That is difficult for people to make that declaration. Um, and in many organizations, it's, it's uh, you know, leaders are feel compelled to put shareholders or customers first. We, we don't take that position. And we're very kind of selfish about it because our view is that uh, the, all the data tells you that when you've got highly engaged, connected, committed, happy, fully flourishing and thriving people, then they're going to take care of customers and shareholders. And that's proven to be true for us. The little difference that we do, though, on this first ingredient around first is that we tend to look at that not so much quite from an HR perspective, because I'm going to come back to how we do that in a minute and one of the other ingredients. But our viewpoint is that when you look at the delivery system of the products and services that you're delivering, you have got to create and design from the, what the experience is to the team member first. That's the lens. So you don't keep asking great people to deliver shitty processes. What you try and do is build great processes and delivery systems and make superheroes out of your team members instead of in the recovery business. So that people first has been the, um, been one of the uh, critical uh, foundations for us. The second is that we spent about a year creating it, what we call our story, 94 words. We decided that, um, that the tired, worn out mission vision stuff work was uh, out of date for a modern organization. So we invested a, enormous amount of time came up with a 94 word narrative around our purpose and we spent then a better part of a year we engaged every single team member in discussing that purpose everyone uh and what it means and how they showed up and we try to turn them into storytellers around how to make the story true and how they could personally emotionally connect to the uh, to the story and by the way I, we continue to do that tomorrow i will do culture day for we we every every uh month we bring all of our new hires together and the ceo and i spend another exec we spend the whole day with all the all we talk about is our story and our values there are 130 people coming together tomorrow to do that and we spend a full day and um and we we, we tell we tell it in the context of stories of uh, uh so those 90 that that 94 word story is the essence of everything we almost read it like uh without sounding corny it's almost like uh, an opening meditation in our company um, and anything we do. And right now, for example, as part of the story, there are thousands of ATBers right now that are making people's lives richer today. And we talk about how they're doing that. That's only one phrase in the 94 words and all 94 words are vital. And then of course, like does, the, it, does everyone memorize all 94 words? 
<laughs> uh, I'll tell you, no, probably not Chris. I know because it's a little bit, you know, that's a lot. It's a, little, it's a little contradictory to what people have said that these things ought to be. Mm-hmm. But if if you leave them at such a bland high level and you put them all into a pile on the coffee table, they all look the same. I'm with you. And so I'll, I'll, I, I bet you a few people could, but I, I, I'll tell you one thing. There are about eight themes in that story, and I'll bet you people could name most of those eight themes. I'm with you. And tomorrow, with the leaders that you're at, are they the line managers that you're meeting tomorrow? Are they the senior leaders within the business, or are they a mix? They're all the new hires. They're all the new the hires. New hires. Is everybody- Amazing. I wanted to, I wanted to hear that because that's even more important. That's incredible. No, they're, they they're every new hire that we've hired in the last 30 days will show up tomorrow. There's 130 of them. Great. Amazing. And, um, and, and we'll go through the story. We go through, we spend two hours on the story itself and the rest of the six hours we go through the, what are now 11 ATBs, which are our values. We, um, uh, we, we, we took a more, you know, we think values have been around for a long time. I have the Enron value cube on my desk as a reminder of how much bullshit's and tied to values. Um, and, uh, because of course the Enron values were integrity trust, you know, and I guess, I guess some of the executives while they're sitting in jail, probably they could sit with their value cube in their lap. But anyway, um, we took a more, uh, Chris, you're too young to remember Enron, but uh, I, I don't know who they are, but I get the, I get the point. <laughs> uh, so are Matt. I'm afraid to say that I might know some of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> uh, but anyway, the the we spend uh, we the eleven uh, what we call our ATBs. Uh, like for example, ATB number four is to be personally and fiercely accountable. So we take and we take all of them. And we tell stories around what that means when you're personally and fiercely about, uh, accountable at ATB. What are the stories? And we do that for all 11. And uh, we had 10 for a long time. We just uh, uh, introduced an 11th around uh, being courageous and uh, inclusive and to be an ally uh, for others. Those 11, um, why they become so powerful for us? Because they first advance people as human beings in addition to advancing our company. So we use those uh, modern uh, way of looking at values. Again, we spend every single person, we spend, um, we go through those values and we refresh them and talk about them on an ongoing basis. The yeah, fourth and, yeah. I'm gonna interrupt you just for a moment. And I, yeah. and, I, and I do think that we'll get through all eight, but just to have a little bit of dialogue around them. Yeah, yeah, um, let's stop and park at them. Yeah, let's, let's park for a second because I, I love, I love already what you shared with us just in terms of the, the people first, customer second, shareholder third. And I mean, I, I think quite frankly, we could have a webcast alone on, on that. <laughs> um, particularly yeah. Matt, Matt and me coming out of retail, I almost lost my lunch when you said that. Um, and so, you know, that is incredible. I, you know, I love that it's, you know, the Southwest Airlines concept, it's, it's clearly very powerful. Um, your 94 words narrative, your storytelling. Uh, the first question I have, and you know, I think I'm gonna throw it, maybe I'll throw it to Matt, um, would be in, in situations like this, you, you can have a, a strong people leader come into an organization. And you know, we're starting to see people evangelists. We're seeing uh, folks like Claude Silver who joined us, the chief heart officer. We're starting to see titles that are purposeful to invoke uh, work that is more really about people and heart and culture. And yet the truth is that not all organizations have progressed to the point where everyone is signed up. And so I can imagine in some organizations, you then have this bifurcated culture where some people are thinking, yes, I love this. I want to spend the day with 130 new hires telling stories and talking about my personal and fierce accountability. And then there's probably a sector of people who are thinking, I don't know why I'm here, or this is making me very uncomfortable or why do I have to do this? Or maybe some folks who, you know, don't, don't like being in groups or, or there's, there's all kinds of things that are perfectly valid and acceptable of people that might not want to participate in that kind of environment. So let's talk a little bit about how we bring people along and how we manage these cultural transformations when in fact, not everybody goes about things like this and I think a lot of our client population, certainly the companies that I'm working with, 
when I come in with what sometimes sound like radical ideas, I see the faces of leaders kind of say, uh, you know, I, I love that, but it's okay. fluffy and not strategic. <laughs> it, or, you know, I love that, but this person and this person are going to have a coronary if I go in and suggest yeah. this. So, um, Matt, first, can you start off by telling us who are you wearing today? Um, and then if you, and then if you could share your thoughts on, on how you would go about that. Uh, I need to remind you that this is the first call we've had two Canadians on, so we don't know. Hey, Matt. Matt. All right. It's a okay, big moment. It's a big I moment. Sure. It's a big Hold moment. On. Just for clarity, what I think I heard him say that he spent a 20-year sabbatical in the U.S. Actually, yeah, he came back. <laughs> he came home. Do not <laughs> force me to be home. I don't know. I guess. I guess I would ask the question of why did he choose to get his deep experience here. All right, on, on to your question, Jill. Otherwise, we're going to have a whole other dispute going on. <laughs> I'm teasing you. Yeah, apparently, Jill and I are going to renegotiate NAFTA on today's uh, webcast. <laughs> um, so, like a couple things. I just think for the audience perspective, the beauty of Jill's questions are that they're very Barbara Walter esque and that they go on for three minutes. And it's really hard to think of the answer as the question continually evolves. <laughs> you have to wait to the last 10 seconds of the question to actually know where you're going to go. Having said that, this little rant allowed me the time to think about an answer, so I'm happy to provide that. Um, so Jill, I think the first thing, and we've had this conversation before on the show, uh, I think the, the most important thing uh, is, you mentioned it already, as did Lauren, it's that alignment at the top. You need to spend the time at the senior level of the organization getting everybody aligned. And Lauren shared a story about how they made some changes at the senior level of the business to achieve that alignment because they realize they would have some barriers to achieving that. So I think it takes a very strong leadership team to say, this is, the, this is where we're going. So it's important to create that, you know, that future facing, where's the direction of the organization, culturally speaking, and then anchor your executive team to that vision. And if there's not alignment around that, then you have some tough decisions to make because if they don't cascade it within their divisions, you're not gonna have transformational change. You're gonna have two parties working against each other. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the first point, Jill, is that executive alignment. And the second point that I just referenced is creating that vision, that simplified vision of the future. So you can anchor storytelling, you can anchor communications, you can anchor change management on the path to that destination. Uh, more often than not, people get nervous when they don't know where they're going. They feel uncertain, they feel insecure about their position and their value in the organization. And things are complicated now, especially because, and let's be honest, work in its general definition is shifting. So not only are people going through transformative change in organizations, but the future of work, if you will, is here. And that pain point around operating in methodologies that may have been conceptualized at the turn of the 20th century, now that we're in the 21st century, is problematic in a lot of organizations. So I think as you're creating that path to the future, I think, Jill, again, just as a recap, the two key pieces for me are that executive alignment to make sure that your leaders are all pulling on the rope in the same direction and setting that tone for change. Uh, and then second is creating that vision for the future and then aligning everybody around the path to get there. I love your comment, Matt. I think you stepped on a really, really specific um, piece that touches every company in every industry. And actually, Chris, um, now I'm going to put you on the spot. It's been a while um, because the where are you going piece is so, so important. Oh, yeah. it's so big. And, and, and I, I've been thinking about it recently. Yeah. yeah. And I was going to, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. And then maybe back to you, Lauren, around, I can't think of any company that I work with or any company I've worked at where when you ultimately peel the onion all the way back, you, people are just concerned about where am I going? When I come tomorrow, what will I be doing? What will you expect of me? Who will I be working with and for? How will I get measured? How will I know I'm doing the right thing? Chris, what are you hearing at your CHRO conversations? Um, well, let me just flip it for a second to my own experience because I'm a startup, right? And our why and our vision is part of 
you know, is hugely important to the direction we're taking as a young team and a young business here. And what we've done to, to do that is we've made, we've made that our, our mission statement as part of our decision-making process. So whenever we have a meeting about a new product or a new, you know, a new strategy, we always ask ourselves, is it in line with what we want to achieve? Is it in line with our bigger picture thinking? Every single decision has to pass that one test. And honestly, sometimes we have these really exciting conversations and we have these incredible discussions and then we go back and say, is that actually in line with our bigger picture and our why and what we want to achieve? And most of the time, a lot of time it's no. Um, so you kind of use it as a way, as a, di- to, to, as a directional tool for us. Secondly, and I love what you said, Lorne, uh, Lorne, about the fact that your leadership team is going to be present tomorrow. And there, it's coming directly from your CEO, if I'm not mistaken. Is that what you said? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And that's so important because I've joined companies in the past where you've had these induction days and it's coming from the HR director, the vision. And it's coming from maybe you know, a junior manager. But the fact that you have the commitment of your senior leadership team that's in, in that for your new stars is incredible. And I see yeah, companies... Yeah. yeah. We, Chris, we have people there that have been in other organizations and they've been in, uh, for, for years have never met the CEO. Yeah, that's, that's why I think it's so important. I didn't meet the CEO for two years when yeah. I started in my company. And it's a small company. It was like 300 people. How crazy is that? And like, I didn't even meet them. And I, 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 just want to, I don't want to forget this question. Uh, and Jill, Jill made me think of it. What did that conversation look like, with, um, Lorne, with you and leadership team? What did that look like? When you approached them and said, you know, this is kind of our, our, our why and our mission statement. But what did that conversation actually look like in terms of getting involved in these type of activities? For example, the meeting tomorrow. What did that conversation look like with them? Well, the way we started the conversation that took on a great, greater richness, um, Chris, is that, you know, sometimes you have to, this whole idea when you ask people who live in grass huts to build a mansion, to build a big grass hut. And so we took our executive team out on kind of a listening tour. So we went to Zappos, we went to Quicken Loans, we went to a variety of other organizations just to have conversations with their executive teams around how they were thinking through story and how they were thinking through a uh, more modern approach to kind of values. That uh, conversation took place uh, for a considerable time so that we could really get our heads around why and how much we wanted to really invest in this. And, uh, but in, in terms of the, 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 the modern values, our, our CEO spent a better part of about, I would say uh, three months personally writing those values he went around interviewed everybody in the company that he wanted to on he was he was bugging everybody on napkins and everything else he came back with a draft and said this is what i think they are this is what i'm obsessed about this is what and i often would say if you cut him open did an autopsy on him those uh atbs would fall out of him and so we were we were highly participatory in getting people to tell stories around the uh, atbs and how they make a difference. We were not very participatory, though, in, in getting group think around writing them. And, and so that, so it was, uh, the conversations were deep, and, um, and it was, so much was connected back, though, to what Matt was saying about the why. And you were talking about it too, Chris, right? If people don't understand the why about what the hell you're doing and where you're going and why it's important, and if they can make a personal emotional connection to it, then you're going to get those, those groups that Joe's talking about where you've got bifurcated groups and you cannot afford to have that in your organization. And we stole something from Zappos. After three months, the CEO calls all the new hires, those people, 130 people, three months from now, tomorrow, will be on a webinar with, uh, with uh, the CEO and we'll invite them to leave and get them a one month, uh, uh, a no questions asked salary to leave. Leave, get the hell out. Yeah. So we want you highly inclusive and diverse. Wow, interesting. <laughs> we want you highly inclusive and diverse. We want your rich, authentic, wonderful you and the most identity and cognitive diversity than any modern organization would think about. But if you're not linked to and you can't make our story true, you can't see yourself in the story, you can't really emotionally and personally connect to the values and get the hell out. Happy to have you go. I bet, yep. you've saved, I bet you've saved a lot of time and money from asking that we question. Have, we have 50,000 <laughs> people to try and get this company every year. And it's not, it's no, it's not a democratic right to work here. And, um, and so we don't want to have blind kind of cult-like behavior. We want cult behavior from our customers, but we want fierce, you know, you have to fight well in our organization. You have to, 
we want a culture where you have to, have, you know, that's why we introduced the 11th ATB around courage, because we want people to, to, to talk back as much as we want them to listen. And though, so we want all the diversity of thought and ideas and identity diversity we, we want, but our common glue are, are, is, our, is our story and our, and our ATBs and our values. Well, let's jump back into your cultural ingredients. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, number, so number four, in, in 2015, uh, in front of 700 leaders, uh, John Maxwell was our guest at this conference. We had a two-day leadership conference. I stood up and said, on behalf of the company, uh, with the support of the CEO and leaders, is that every uh, ATB or has a right to great leadership. Every single one. And leaders have a responsibility to be great, not perfect. And then we defined exactly what that meant and then spent over, well, we've continued to do it, on um, our, our, what we call leader all in. And we, uh, we've taken 900 leaders through exactly what it means. Three outcomes. Get great results. People have got to want to work for you. And you've got to develop other people. Those are the three outcomes we expect from people. And six practices. You've got to be able to sell a compelling vision. People need to know their expectations. You've got to coach like hell. You've got to seek feedback first and give it. And then you've got to be able to continuously grow and, sell, and then learn how to celebrate and recognize people. Those are the practices, three outcomes, 900 leaders, and with stories around what it's like when we behave that way and what it's like when we're not. So that's the fourth ingredient. And I don't know many organizations have declared the thing that they expect that people have a right to great leadership. And we have. And we've been intentional about describing it. And then we've tied everything, our succession system, our reward system, with leaders to that. So that's number four. I'll stop there if anybody's got a reaction or I'm I try to make, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that it's, it's uh, maybe causing some reaction. I don't expect you all to agree with it, but that's the way we declare it. I'm reacting. <laughs> well, Good. if I'm awake, I'm reacting. So um, how do you measure that? How do you determine that? And then what do you do if someone isn't meeting the expectations? So uh, when you have your, uh, when we have our one-on-ones, when we have our reviews, which we uh, have tried to blow up annual reviews, which we think is such a waste of time, uh, ratings are so nonsense and, you know, because what they do is they detract from the psychological safety of the organization and they're by and large useless. But uh, we expect every leader to have a conversation to bring your evidence. So if you're going to be fiercely accountable, tell me about the results that you've achieved. Show me how people want to work for you and line up to work for you. So what's the data? By the way, we do full 100 and regular uh, uh, feedback sessions from people. Like we do the classic um, 180 degree review or 360 degree review. So we try to, we want leaders to seek feedback first because we know uh, leaders are all excited often about wanting to give feedback, but we think it's more important to ask for it. Because once you ask for feedback first, you start to set the example in the organization. It's okay to be a constant learner. So we ask people to get that feedback, bring it to me, show me. And then third is that, who have you developed? I want to see, tell me the 10 people that have worked for you and where have they gone? What are they doing? What have you done to develop them? And then tell me your, tell me the, you know, going back to Matt's thing about people need to know where they're going. Show me where you're the direction that, and the message that you're sharing with your team members and your group around where you're taking the team. Um, you know, so, you know, tell me about the last 10 celebrations you've had and what they look like. So those are the conversations that go on. When people are out of sync with that, we either develop them or, frankly, we have to move them out because we can't afford to have leaders. They're not going to be perfect, but we can afford to have leaders that uh, aren't in the business of getting great results, developing others, and having people want to work for them, Joe. So we, we develop them or move them out. Sometimes they're better b- back as individual contributors, but sometimes they just have to leave the company. There are many companies that are putting those kinds of measures in place and they run up against the challenge of leaders in the organization that are the best deliverer, the less best deliverers of actual business results who may not be delivering the best leadership results. That's why you have to have courage because that's the biggest, uh, the the wake that they leave behind. So I'm going to ask you this, your, your, your audience do this. Get a bunch of people together and ask what it's like and what the experience is like around the re- a leader that has not brought the best out of them, a leader that's actually been difficult to work with. And I'll bet you, you will find that people are carrying emotional luggage from that 
from even years back. They remember the moment. People talk about their hair falling out, going home and, you know, wanting to have Matt, a... Matt, Matt, are you okay? See, Matt, you could happen to you, buddy. That's, you, just, you just stepped on a very sensitive topic. I had an immediate um, like flashback when you said that to one yeah. of my managers. Like as soon as you as soon as you said that, immediately I was thinking of one of my managers that basically should have been a, an in, a stayed as an individual contributor, but then became a, a director. Don't we all? Doesn't doesn't everyone? Don't we all have that manager in our lives? I think. Yeah. So, so I we challenge, we challenge everybody. Do you want you know all of you all of our leaders? Do you want to be the topic of your dinner conversation at people's homes and? What do you want that conversation to be? So back to your point, Joe, how can we afford someone who gets great sales results by beating the hell out of people and leaves carnage behind and we don't look at it systemically? And that's a, it's a big cop out and it's, it takes, and it's there because of lack of leadership courage, frankly. Yeah. Anyway, I, mean, I, I, I personally, I couldn't agree with you more. I can tell you um, as an HR leader, I've been in the room, more times than I would like to admit or count where I have had a similar conversation, but at the end of the day, there's fear in the business by someone that's driving the bottom line that says, this person is leaving carnage and we know it, but if this person leaves, we could lose that account or you know, fill in the blank and there's just fear and the fear is tied directly to the financials. Matt, yeah. have you seen this as well? Yeah, so I think I just, we talked about this on a recent show as well. Since it's the same themes come up over and over and over again, part of the challenge we have is that most business leaders, and I'll start at the board level in you know North America, they have a single responsibility to their shareholder. That's it. It's short-term results. It's quarter by quarter. So when you're asking them to take action against high-performing individuals or help them deliver their quarterly earnings statement, it's they're in conflict because they understand inherently more often than not that it's not the right decision. But self-preservation they're going to change the path of least resistance and that doesn't go away as you get more seen in your career it just gets harder to say no um, whereas you have other jurisdictions like germany for example where they have a shared responsibility to not only the shareholder but to the survival of the firm which is a really important distinction because for those who don't understand kind of board governance if you have a if you have a survival of a firm as one of your measures you inherently have to look at the firm's financial performance on the longer term horizon because you have an obligation to the employees in the organization and the take that the government takes in Germany is that if a firm survives it ultimately benefits the, the nation's economy um, so from that perspective um, just so critical that you apply long-term thinking um, and the hard part about that, Jill, is negotiating with your shareholder, whether it's internally or externally, the time and the space and the breathing room to achieve that. Um, otherwise, you're gonna be constantly in that short-term, long-term struggle. Thank you, Matt. Lauren, I apologize. I have to jump off today's show a little bit early, but I, I absolutely love what you're sharing, and I hope you appreciate the provocativeness with which we are approaching oh, yeah. this. Because we, we know sort of what our listeners are probably up against, but I think that what you've been able to accomplish and the kinds of things you're putting out there are exactly what people need to exactly, be trying. Yeah. And, and you've been successful at coming up with eight measures. And for some people and in some companies, if they can get two or maybe three across and start to see change, it will be magnificent but i it's been for me wonderful learning to get to talk with you and i hope that we get the full the full benefit of your eight measures um great learning great conversation thank you so very much nice, Joe. yeah say say that all my friends in the city for me will you in new york uh, city here in the u.s yeah yeah but that's the only one city that i know so uh yeah yeah well i would have thought so yankees yeah. or mets Oh, um, well, that's that's a real toss up in our house. I grew up Mets. My husband would say Yankees. Um, so we are a 50 50 home. Oh, there you go. Like many New York homes. Take care, yeah. Joe. Have a good one. Bye, guys. Bye -bye. Uh, by the way, I, that, I love that point that we just spoke about because I've seen that go horribly wrong in organizations, in, in, especially in sales. I think that's where it has the biggest impact uh, in, in any department. Sales is where it has the most impact. And I come from a sales background and I've seen, you know, three or four of those guys existing in my company. And I have been in meetings with, with my HR team and said, yeah, but they generate 200,000 pounds a year. So we'll just let it, let it slide. And, and I saw that a lot. 
and in my 10 years working in various companies as well. You know, you know, what, you know what's so interesting about it, Chris, because I've seen it too. And what I, what I find though, where, where people always, it's this notion of uh, fear being false, expectations appearing real. What happens typically when organizations get rid of that particular individual? Everyone else flourishes. Exactly. I know, the, I've seen it. It doesn't go away. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't go away. Yeah, I know, and yeah. I just don't get it. It's it's courage and because um, they're difficult conversations. And so we avoid the unpleasant truth and just try to avoid it. And you know, there are whatever all the other reasons are. And it's it's and, and there's a courage deficit right now in leadership in, uh, in organizations. And the well, longer term view that Matt's talking about is, is, is important too. If you've got someone who's nothing but a short term, um, and wrings their hands every quarter about the stock price, and that's all they're about. And I'm not going to be unrealistic. I've been a CEO too. I get it. Uh, but it's going to take you to the wrong place. So one thing I just want to call out is, and I think it's an important distinction, this is the danger of using a single data point to determine value on anything. So if you measure someone's performance by what they deliver on the bottom line and don't look at all the peripheral information that's complementary, you're not seeing the full picture. So well, yeah. You're, yeah. You're if the performance of everyone around them is suffering, it's probably a reason why. Delivering great individual results. Yeah. Take a look. At, take a look at the Uber example right now. I was watching a bit of television last night, and I saw the new uh, CEO quote of Uber talking about, "Hey, we're taking now. We're trying to make we, this is the new Uber. We're ta we're ta we're caring for our drivers. We're caring for our customers, and we're caring for the cities that we're working in, like the." You know, the traditional, the culture of the first CEO was, you know. Um, World you domination. Know, <laughs> yeah, be careful when you throw kegs of beer off the top of the hotel when we're having our, our celebration so it doesn't hurt too many people. And, uh, you know, and I won't spend too much time because I don't want to be disparaging around a, um, a company. That, but, but, I, but, but to your point, it, that hurt, the reputation hurt that company so much that, and we see it over and over again, that you've got to take an integrated look. So even though the laws are a little bit different in each country around where your fiduciary responsibility and duty of care is, you better start looking and paying attention to all your stakeholders because at the end of the day, you, that's the way it's going to, uh, you know, it's, it, you're going to be measured more, more than just in a narrow view and a single viewpoint for sure. And you can't get away with it in this day and age. But the, no. ever, the ever of the internet and social media as well, like every CEO is under scrutiny. And every CEO is that face of the organization. In the past, you probably didn't even know who the CEO was <laughs> of most of these companies. And now they're almost a public facing figure, um, whether they like it or not. Yeah. Um, and, and you're one tweet away from, from uh, being out the door because the boards can't handle the reputation risk and seeing your stock price drop X percent because your CEO has done something that is untowards. And I mean, it's uh, so this transparency and transparency and visibility is, is, uh, is it, it is causing I think boards to look at a things in a much more integrated kind of way around risk management. That's why, frankly, for uh, culture is coming to the forefront not just because it's trendy, but because frankly it's absolutely the right thing to think about for the business. Mm -hmm. Well, I add one more thing, which is I'm talking, Lauren. I love your perspective on this. I'm talking to more senior HR leaders these days. We're having these conversations with themselves, going, some of the things that are happening here. Five years ago, okay, today I'm struggling with the values alignment and they're concerned about their own. Exactly. Um, and people are making decisions on their own brand because they know that they're, to your point, one tweet away or one you know, employee review away on Glassdoor from themselves being called into scrutiny. So you see a lot more people making decisions based on personal brand um, and organizations wonder why people are leaving at a high rate. Yeah, you know, that's such a good point, Matt. You know, like, and by the way, I'm glad, I'm glad you raised Glassdoor because, you know, I think the Glassdoor is becoming by, you know, the, the default position. Like I was, um, like our Glassdoor score has been around 4.4 for most of uh, the last five years. I think we're down just a, a hair, but, um, but we have paid close attention to it. Facebook did, I, I don't know if you heard this, they did this research. I was listening to this presentation from uh, one of their senior execs just a couple weeks ago. When they lose all their top people, when they do the data, most of them go to somebody with a higher glass door score. Where do they get all their top talent from? Are people then leave them? It's where people look now. It's the new, it's the new, uh, and also it's the new, it's the way the new generation shop around for a job. Like yeah, exactly. you know, they're, they're no longer going on, you know, job sites. 
they're not going on a job site looking for it. You know, they're looking at a glass door and there's a, there's a going up. on Yelp to pick our restaurant. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's like, it's, it's like TripAdvisor, but for jobs. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Everyone seems to be doing that now. And I've only, only in the last uh, year, I think or so, have I seen that the CHROs and the leaders are taking it serious. Only, oh, man. I, only I, recently. I, I've only, I'm like, guys, you're kind of a bit late on this, but <laughs> better late than never <laughs> to, to realize the impact that it has. I, I think you need to assign full-time resource to attend to your glass to, to, to the comments and what's going on there and to really pay attention because it's a it's it's important and the data there's enough data there mm-hmm. for sure the, the the fifth ingredient then I, I we made this promise to people uh, uh, six years ago and it continues to be the core of our promise we have no idea as none of us do around what the, our industry looks like X number of years, three years, it's hard to look three years, right? Mm-hmm. You can look this year and 10 years, maybe you have better luck looking 10 years in one year, but three is hard. But what you can't, so you can't promise anything. I don't even have no idea how banking is going to be delivered through AI and machine learning and everything else. We have the one promise we can make to every team member though, is that think about your last day here first and you will leave richer and we will invest in you in every possible way around your personal equity. So we make a, personal equity promise. We promise you'll leave richer financially, emotionally, um, experientially, and even spiritually. Um, um, it, it, and we deeply care and invest around the personal equity promise that we give to every single team member. And we take that very seriously from, uh, and, and we don't like to use our people and phrases like that because we're all people here, all part, uh, all employees, and we're all looking to advance our personal equity here at, um, the practical outcome of that is we do things that we call experiential bursts at ATB. So if you are uh, in our leadership group, which is called Club Catalyst, there are about 900 or so people, you can sign up for all kinds of, to do experiential bursts. You can go to board meetings. You can uh, go to uh, our executive meetings. You can take on a Nardi project for a period of time. You can run a conference. You can go build houses at Habitat for Humanity for a week. You can do all kinds of stuff just because we want to accelerate your experience and we don't want people to have 30 years with us doing the same thing. So they just have one year of experience done 30 times. We want people, we try to really move people. So tomorrow, Chris, when I do my uh, culture day, 130 people, the very first thing when they all get settled in and the, and they sit down and they finally kind of get, comfortable with the people they're sitting at the table with we ask them to stand up and move i'm gonna do that at my next event <laughs> it's great everybody gets kind of grumpy and pissed off yeah but the metaphor is is that if you're not moving at atb all the time you're not growing and i don't mean moving and jumping around jobs i'm talking about you know a deep learning around going through and getting experiences so that personal equity promise has been important to us so that's the fifth one um on, a, on the sixth one is acute listening. So I think um, the metaphor we use is like, if you think of a driverless car, it has 70,000 sensors, I think, or so on a driverless car. So we're trying to, like, we used to have one employee engagement survey. We want, we want a relentless avalanche of constant listening feedback in all kinds of ways. And so we have totally upped the way that we're listening. Um, trying to use technology as a way to kind of, uh, and big data to help us with that. So we think we're still early days of what acute listening is, but we're 10 xing how we listen to each other and customers. And, um, and that means that we're in constant touch with listening posts around the organization. So we're doubling down on, on that. Let me offer an example of what we've done here, Lauren, because I know there are some folks that are going to ask themselves, okay, so got it. We should do more surveys, don't have the budget, don't have the resources. Um, let me offer a tactical example of what we've done here uh, at ISK. I can promise you that I also don't have a budget or resources. Yeah. Um, we were able to accomplish the following, which is we have tethered all of our employee surveys under a single platform. So we do have an annual employee survey but we also engage new hires three to four times in the first 90 days of their employment with very short yeah. regimented, you know, day one, day seven, day 30, day 90, yeah. and ask them three simple questions. Um, and we use that to benchmark the experience. I use it for a couple of reasons. One, like yourself, Lauren, I want exponential amounts of employee data. Um, two, 
I want to be really, really simple and consistent so we can look for trends. And specifically, I'm looking for, for process breakdowns in our onboarding orientation process. Because if you're getting feedback from people and they're turning over quickly, it's really difficult to isolate where exactly you have your breakdown. So by having surveys at specific touch points, you can find out where your failure points are after a certain amount of critical mass. What we use, what we, what we used before was SurveyMonkey. Yeah. It, it'd be complicated. And yeah. you know, send out a survey. On it works. Onboarding. It works. Same thing, right? It, works. it needs to be a flashy tool. Back and you get very, <laughs> and again, this is not a, this is not a 60 question survey. This is three questions. Yep. Same, same thing happens every single time. Same three questions. And we correlate the results and then we feed it back to the business. Yeah. Um, that's a very simple example of how today you can go on and get a free survey monkey account free and with a little bit of resources print off the people who join your organization and figure out the appropriate cadence now we have a solution that automates it for us so it triggers the survey to be sent at various stages of somebody's employment anniversary based on yep. their hris information um, you can do a more rudimentary way which is more manual and achieve the same result uh, our way just is a bit more efficient around resources um, but we love collecting data from employees. We love to contextualize data. And I think one really second point I'll make, Lauren, then I'll turn over to you for number seven is, um, I think it's really important, again, that you don't isolate singular data points and then go right off and solve somebody else's problem for them. You need to contextualize the feedback and bounce it off them and say, okay, as a cohort, you answered this. Now articulate for me and contextualize for me what this means for you. Because yeah. every single person, that answer could be a little bit different. And I see constantly in organizations where HR teams or senior executives get their hands on macro data, apply their own values to the right. information, and solve for their own problems, mindful of the fact that 99% of the people in the organization don't live their lives. And yeah. they're the ones that are going to move the organization forward or not. So right. I think it's critical that as a leader, that as you're getting data points around employee engagement or exit interviews or whatever that looks like, that you're contextualizing it with the actual respondees, not just saying, well, I've been here three years, I know all the problems in the company, this is the reason why people are leaving the organization. That's really, really, really dangerous because if you're gonna solve a problem that doesn't exist, you might actually make it worse. Yeah, no, very true. And I loved your practical example. And you know, we have the sophistication here because we have data scientists and we have lots of data. For example, we have an, uh, a social media uh, recognition platform. On a good month, 30,000 employees will give 30, I mean, 5,000 employees will give each other about 30,000 recognition. We're using Watson to mine that data. Like in a sense, like what are we learning? You know, what are we learning from the givers of the data, the receivers, I mean, the recognition receivers. So that's the more sophisticated. But you know what? As a leader, you can, you can push a beer cart or an ice cream uh, cart around every Friday afternoon and say, what the hell is going on? What's, you know, and you look at your, you look at your calendar, you go, what's more important to be out there listening or to be out there going on some meeting on some, you know, um, no, you know, some non-value added activity. So I, I, I th there's a practical, very, it's the, uh, it's the intentionality around deep listening and doing it more than just, you know, kind of an annual kind of a prescriptive thing. So I, I love your perspective. Long, can I ask what software you use? Are you able to share that? For yeah, the, uh, for the um, it's Achievers platform. Okay. Yeah. And they have been phenomenal. It has been a phenomenal platform. We have unbelievable. It's so root. We've been doing it for six years now. Okay. And the day we turned it on, we had over 90% participation. It's the, it's the, it's the way people naturally just give recognition. The part though, I just, Chris, to your question there is that it's way more than a recognition system. It's become our storytelling system. Yeah. It's how you say to people, I see you. I see you, Chris. I see what you've done. Thank you, and you share it with each other publicly. And it's anyway. And it's not just you. It's not just. You. I think the reason I just quickly said that because it's not just you guys. You know, it's, it's their peers, it's their managers, it's people in other departments. It's everybody. You know, it's everyone, and and that's why it's, I I brought it up because not many companies have tools like that in place. I know it's, it, it, there is a cost attached, obviously, but I think it's very very important. And and yeah. and that's and that's a cultural thing as well. Yeah, you know, we get caught up in this cost stuff around. I mean, obviously, we have to manage a business. Uh, the when you think about the investment, the return you get on people being able to celebrate constantly, acknowledge each other, reach yeah. across. I mean, it's like you know you have to open yourself to to that. And like Chris is pointing out, there's a lot of cheap stuff out there and apps and stuff that we can use that you don't have to go with a sophisticated point-based system. In fact, 
we, we have a point system and people can buy shit and stuff like that. But frankly, the everyday recognition of just saying thank you is way more. Yeah, exactly. Coming from you personally. Yeah. Well, and also it, it reinforces the fact that recognition is not a manager to employee paradigm. Like yeah, that's, it, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah, it's a cultural like, thing. So you, when you create a dynamic where people are expecting their leader to come to them and give them positive recognition, you, you forget the fact that the individual who expects it can also give it. And by creating a platform and a community that allows that to happen two ways, you can have employees thank their managers. You can have managers thank their employees. You can have managers thank other managers. So yeah. by creating that dynamic, it creates a, a really nice synergy, whereas most traditional recognition programs are top down. And yeah. therefore, you require the leadership team to identify and recognize somebody else. And then you have conversations around things like nepotism and fairness and equity and do they see what I'm doing? Because let's be honest, as an executive, I don't have a chance to interact with all of our employees every single day. I don't see all the great work happening, but their peers do. And, exactly. and that is so critical and makes, especially in a dispersed environment like we have, Lauren, where you're in, you know, in retail yeah. financial services. I'm in retail with 65 locations. Yeah. We can't do it or wear it once. So allow the teams to empower themselves and take ownership over their own recognition. Yeah, completely. It's like way more yeah. powerful than people. The uh, seventh ingredient is uh, having a growth and disruptive mindset. So we, um, I took 50 people to Singularity uh, University and because uh, I wanted to have them get a firsthand feeling of what it is to go through exponential, uh, through, through understanding exponential change and uh, kind of get the holy shit kind of experience around what's coming out and the convergence of technology. The larger issue though is sort of in the Carol Dweck Stanford work kind of, kind of work is that we, we can't have people with fixed mindsets working for us at ATB. You can't, you've got to be prepared to continuously reinvent yourself. What you did last year, frankly, is we appreciate it, but it doesn't matter going forward. If you are not moving yourself to where the company's going, then you can't work here. So, Everybody, it doesn't matter what role you have, you're in the reinvention, reinvention growth business. And we provide conditions for people to do it, but we expect that everybody does it. And the leaders have got to set the example around doing it. So we do all kinds of things to promote and develop that in our company. And, and uh, we, I just can't, I, I, did a, I do a, a live uh, a session every Friday at 11 o'clock, kind of like this. And um, uh, about two months ago, I had uh, one of our, 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 our team member has been with us for 50 years. And wow. Georgia's, Georgia's whole message was, let me tell you how I reinvent myself every day. She started as a, uh, as a quote in that language at that time, a secretary where she was running around getting coffee. And now she's one of our top financial advisors. So she what an inspiration for constantly redeveloping yourself and living in a, and, and having this view around, uh, as a matter of fact, she was the janitor for a period of time because she got demoted from a secretary to a janitor. And now, you know, so, and talk about, you know, but this idea of everybody, everybody all in growing all the time. And then the final one, and I'll get on with this. So, cause I know I'm kind of chewing up your time here, but I think it's the breakthrough one that we've added around peer to peer power. So a year ago, uh, the CEO asked me to lead uh, the move will completely from Microsoft to, to the G Suite. And in one year, we've completely reinvented the way we That work. must have been such a pain, by the way. <laughs> it was a fun person. <laughs> you know what? When we first started out, can you imagine telling everybody's got I a know, career? I know. Stuff? Yeah, I can only imagine telling everyone that message. Well, we spent, we changed, we made it a cultural initiative, not a technology one. And it was one of the finest moments in my career. It's been one of the most wonderful because uh, we wanted, so the vision we created was a work renaissance so that people would free people up to work differently. And I can tell you today that we've got, Microsoft is pretty much, other than Excel where we use uh, here and there, but we pretty much, uh, and Microsoft's a great company, it's got nothing to do with that. We just needed to change the way people thought about working around the amount of ways we do things on Google Meet and Hangouts where we're vis visual. You're, you're not, you're expected to see each other, to be there and to show up to be seen on video. The amount of collaboration on docs and, and shared drives and, and the work that we're using with AI and Sheets and Data Studio and Tableau and the bigger thing that's ridiculous though is we have 500 communities and we have changed the way people help each other. So for example, we're doing something where we're introducing 
900 iPads into the um, into the branches and and we're we're uh, onboarding new customers in five minutes instead of 40 minutes now. The teaching is coming from going to the G Plus community and learning from all your colleagues, not calling a 1-800 number or sending out a box of training material, or it's a YouTube video, it's a team member on a G Plus community. But what we've done is we started to democratize the living hell out of the way work is happening. It's not vertical. It's becoming way much more network. Uh, and we are fundamentally changing the whole way the company is, is, is working. So those are the eight ingredients. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm underwhelming them all, but I do have a view. Think big, think big, uh, start small, but do it friggin' now. And I think you can, uh, reinvent. As a matter of fact, I put a million bucks on the table. And I know this is going to sound a little bit arrogant. I don't mean it that way, but I put a million bucks on the table. If someone gave me a 10 X return on it, that uh, all those eight ingredients could walk into any company anywhere. Uh, there are a couple caveats. The leadership team has to get around it. You can reinvent your culture and take it to a whole nother level. Uh, that's how strongly I feel about um, it'll be unique, but these things work, but they have to create a system. And, um, and then have the, uh, the courage to stick to it and keep building and be lucky a little bit along the way too. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, I'm, uh, I, there's so much information to process <laughs> <laughs> on my end. I'm just thinking, and, and it's, it's really cool because, you know, obviously starting my own company, every time I have this conversation, I have my CEO hat on and I have, yeah. then I have my listeners hat on <laughs> and then the audience, right? So I'm kind of taking it in from both perspectives, reflecting on what I'm doing here with my team, but also our customers and sharing it with the HR leaders and, and, and all of the leaders really out there as well. And it's incredible to have. So I really, really appreciate you taking the time to join Hey, us. Chris, and if that, you're very welcome. And, uh, you know, these ATB, uh, ATB is very generous. We're very abundant with, with what we have. As any, if anybody of your audience would like uh, a copy of the, of the, uh, AT, the uh, eight ingredients, we'd be happy to share. That was my question, by the way. <laughs> I was there to say, yeah, where can we, where can we learn more about um, you guys and, and, and you know what? I'm going to share with Matt and you and you guys share it with your audience and the way you see fit and, um, and uh, it belongs to ATB, but uh, like we have a, an abundant view of, of sharing everything we have because we're all in the business of advancing culture and advancing work. And I really want to compliment you guys in this incredible podcast. I cannot believe the momentum you guys have. It's phenomenal. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored to have uh, been part of it. Well, it doesn't work. It doesn't work without people like you. So I'll make sure, guys, for, for everyone listening, I'll link, uh, put a link in the description on both on LinkedIn and on the podcast. Anywhere you find us, there'll be a link in the description to download what we've discussed. And anything that we've mentioned on this episode will be linked uh, in the notes for you all to find. Uh, thank you again, Lon, for joining us. Before you go, last question for you. If there's a question you have for our listeners, what would that be? Because I'm going to post that on LinkedIn so we can give you some feedback. So if there's one question you could ask all of the HR leaders out there, what would that be? How do you uh, inspire uh, more courage um, uh, in your organization uh, to really put people and culture first? Amazing. How might you, how might you do it and then go friggin' do it? <laughs> fantastic well yeah, well thanks again well thank you again matt for being an incredible co-host as always and uh, for everyone listening if you haven't already subscribed make sure you do to keep up to date with current events and uh, when we go next go live uh, apart from that i'll let you guys go and i look forward to seeing everyone next week nice seeing you matt take care chris <laughs>